All right, brethren, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Ben, if you want to open that back door, you can open it so it might cool off a little bit more. I'm sorry, y'all, I forgot to turn the... I always forget. I'm so used to the schedule. I forget to turn the air on when the, we have these meetings on these off days. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians 1. We saw last time that it's God's righteous judgment right now to overrule persecution and to overrule tribulation to make his people worthy for the kingdom of God. He does that because our, our only worthiness is Christ. And so as troubles come and persecutions come, God's ruling that to make us, to grow us in faith in Christ, to trust Christ to save us. He's growing us in patience to wait on Christ till he, till he delivers us. And as he delivers us, he grows us in hope, knowing, reassuring us that all God's promises are yes and amen in Christ, that he has delivered, is delivering, and shall deliver. So all of that's God's righteous doing right now for his people. But tonight we're going to see God's righteous judgment when Christ returns. When Christ returns, he will justly repay his enemies. He will justly repay his enemies, and he will justly give his saints rest with him in glory. All in justice. It's a righteous thing. Look here, verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. And the reason is there in the parentheses, because our testimony among you was believed. Our subject is a righteous thing with God. A righteous thing with God. We're going to see God's righteous judgment upon the unbeliever. We're going to see God's righteous judgment upon Christ in place of his people. And then we're going to see God's righteous judgment toward all who believe in that day. First of all, for the unbeliever, those who trouble God's saints, God gives righteous trouble. He gives righteous trouble. Verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense. That word is to repay. To repay. To recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. To recompense trouble to them that trouble you. Now we saw last time, and you know that God is righteous. He's righteous. He only works righteousness. Everything God does is righteous. Now in this world right now, you that believe are often troubled. You're often troubled by those who know not God, who believe not on the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if somebody's not directly persecuting you, even unbelieving family, unbelieving friends, they trouble you because you want them to know the Lord. And But they're speaking specifically here of those that trouble us with persecution and and uh, slander and, and all sorts of trouble. But it's a righteous thing with God right now to recompense trouble to them. And he's going to protect his people right now. The same Lord, the same Christ who stood between the Pharisees and that woman called in adultery, he's standing between his people right now and those that would trouble you. He, he will come between us and he'll give you rest right now. But in the day of judgment... It will be God's righteous judgment to give them that trouble his saints just trouble, just tribulation, tribulation that is just. Now, knowing this, knowing that right now he's the one that's going to save us from trouble, and knowing that the day 
of our Lord is coming and vengeance belongs to him. That's why God's saints don't take vengeance right now. I ask Adam to read Psalm 94. You see there, to whom belongs vengeance? To our Lord, to whom belongs vengeance? That's what the psalmist was praying. And he was depending on him. And that's what scripture tells us. Look over at Romans 12. And we need to know this. The, the saints at Thessalonica needed to know this. They were suffering a lot. And it's our, just our knee-jerk reaction in our flesh. Our sinful nature wants to take vengeance. We want to recompense. We want to repay. We, we, want, to, we want to render trouble for trouble to them that trouble us. But in our new man, the Lord's teaching us, don't do it. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Look here, Romans 12, 19. He says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. See there, I will recompense. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. Isn't that what Christ did for you and me when we were hungry and thirsty? When we were his enemy, when we didn't love him and we didn't want anything to do with him, what did he do for us? He came and clothed us in his righteousness and fed us this gospel and, and gave us the water of life. So he says, when your enemy, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. Deuteronomy 32, 43, the Lord said, Their rock's not like our rock. That's what our enemies say. You ever heard that? Men, men will, you'll declare the gospel to them, and they'll say, Well, that's not my Jesus. They say that. Their rock's not like our rock. But here's what our rock said. He said, Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. You see, we're going to see here the vengeance that he's going to render to them that trouble his saints, to those that do not believe on Christ, those that meet God without a righteousness, the vengeance he will render to them, we deserve that same vengeance. But he had mercy on us, and he still has mercy on us. So if you ever get to that point where you feel like rendering vengeance, you go read that Psalm 94 again. And real think real hard. Read Romans 12 again and wait on the Lord. But Toward the unbeliever who troubles God's saints, God's vengeance shall be righteous. He said there in verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God. That's our subject, a righteous thing with God. And it's a righteous thing with God to recompense, to repay tribulation to them that trouble you. Look at the second part of verse 7. He says, When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father has put all judgment into the hand of the Lord Jesus. All judgment is his. Isn't this amazing that the very one who came and saved his people and to satisfy justice for us, now... All judgments given to him, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, all judgments his, and the very one who is the Savior, who's the advocate for his people before the Father, the righteousness of God with his people, is the one men are despising and rejecting, and they're persecuting God's saints because of them. And that's the very one who's going to be the judge in that last day. But toward the unbeliever, he shall be revealed in flaming fire taking vengeance. In flaming fire taking vengeance. And his vengeance will be just. It will be just because they know not God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? To know God is to know him as holy. And when you know him as holy, you know yourself as nothing but a sinner. And to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is to repent from everything about ourselves. 
That means to have a changed mind concerning everything about us and everything about God is to see ourselves as sinful, as wicked, as iniquity, as in no way being able to bring a work of righteousness to God and make ourselves accepted. Uh, no way able to make ourselves holy before God or keep ourselves in holiness before God. It's, it's to know that salvation's of the Lord so that we repent from ourselves entirely from all the works of righteousness of trying to make ourselves righteous, from all the works of trying to make ourselves pure and holy, from all the works of, of sin and rebellion. It's turning from ourselves entirely and from this world and from everything in it and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, calling on him for mercy and resting in him. This is all in the heart, in the inward man. But you see, it's righteous for God. And be sure to get what our text says. God saves and God damns in righteousness. He saves and he damns in righteousness. All his works are righteousness. Now, from eternity, I, I touched on this Sunday, from eternity, God's election of grace, though it was not based on any good or evil in us, it was based on a work of righteousness. It was in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was all in his righteousness. For God to receive sinners like us, there's going to have to be righteousness brought in. We're going to be made perfect to be accepted of God. So it wasn't, that election of grace wasn't because he saw some in us, but what he saw in Christ and what Christ, who Christ is. He's the righteousness of his people. But also from eternity, God did not arbitrarily predestinate men to hell. Not arbitrarily. God doesn't arbitrarily pour out vengeance on anybody. Sinners earn it by their sin by not believing on Christ. God's hatred of sinners, his, his hatred of the wicked every day, is due to man's own sinful rebellion. God's salvation and God's vengeance is righteous. His salvation of his people is righteous in the righteousness of Christ, and his vengeance, his justice upon sinners is righteous due to the sinner's sin. He does everything in righteousness. He doesn't just damn somebody to hell for no reason. Would a judge on the throne be just in this in court of law here if he just took a man off the street and just sentenced him to prison for no reason? You'd say that wouldn't be just. God doesn't send men to hell for no reason. The cause of salvation is God's grace by Christ's righteousness, by giving us faith in Christ. The cause of condemnation is man's sin. In Scripture, condemnation always has a because attached to it. Condemnation always has a because attached to it. That's why I hear it's called a recompense. He's repaying sinners for something they earned. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life. You see, men earn condemnation. They earn death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And here the, they, he's recompensing what they earn because they know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ said, here it is to obey. He said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he sent. Look over at 2 Thessalonians 2 and look at verse 10. I'm trying to show you this. I've heard people say God just arbitrarily, randomly predestinated men to hell. No, he didn't. In eternity, election is based is grace. It's an active work of God electing his people and, and choosing them in Christ because of Christ's righteousness. But his condemnation of men is going to be because men fell in Adam and men coming into the world corrupt and men passed through this world reje rejecting him. They earn the wages of sin, which is death. Look here, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. It says here, here's why God, just look at the second part there, 2 Corinthians 2.10. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that includes the unrighteousness of man's own works, his own best religious works. 
Look at John 3. I just want to show you real quick. I want you to get this point because you're going to hear men say things that, that I just randomly, arbitrarily predestinated them into hell. I said to you before, whatever you look at in this book, let this be the touchstone. Is it holy? Is it righteous? Because when it comes to how God does anything, is it righteous and holy? Because that's the only way God does anything. Now look here. The Lord says it. John 3.18. He that believeth on Christ is not condemned. This is Christ speaking. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Here it is right here. Light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Because everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest the deed should be reproved. That's what Christ said. That's why men are condemned. We fell in Adam. We come into this world dead in sin. And we love our sin. And we love, we love darkness. And we won't come to light. And for that reason, meet God without, without Christ. And for that reason, God will recompense. He will pay the wages of sin which is death. I'm telling you, if you've not believed on Christ, if you're sitting here now and you hadn't believed on Christ, fall down at his feet. I'm talking in your heart, broken hearted, fall down at his feet and beg him for mercy and cast all your care on him. This day's coming. This day we're talking about in our text is coming and we're going to stand before God. Faith in Christ is obeying the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get what I said. Faith in Christ is obeying the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Believing on Him, trusting Him, putting it all in His hand and counting Him to be your only acceptance with God. That's what it is to obey the gospel. Now, in that day, back in 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, in that day, Christ's just condemnation the punishment will be everlasting destruction. Verse 9. They should be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Everlasting destruction means when we pass from this life and we die, it won't be the end of our being. If we don't have Christ, it will only be the end of our well-being. But it won't be the end of our being. We're eternal souls and we're going to live eternally somewhere. The first resurrection is the resurrection of Christ. All his people arose in him when he arose. And then in the new birth and regeneration, he raises us to newness of life to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you took part in that first resurrection, this second death he's talking about here won't have any power on you. Let me show you that in Revelation 20 and verse 6. Christ's resurrection and then being resurrected the newness of life and regeneration, that's the first resurrection. And if you partake of that by God's grace, and it will be God's grace only, but if you partake of that and believe on Christ, this second death, this everlasting destruction won't have any power on you. Watch this. Revelation 20 verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You know what that thousand years is? It's, it's been, it started when Christ came in these last days. And those that are born of him and given faith to behold him and see we arose in him in that first resurrection, they are made priests unto God by the blood of Christ. And we've been reigning with Christ ever since he called us to faith. And that thousand years is not a literal thousand years. It means a set, definite period of time. This gospel age shall last a set period of time till Christ's return. Now watch this, verse, Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see that? 
The second death, our text says, back in first, Second Thessalonians 1, verse 9, the second death, it says, it is everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Now, it certainly will be that when Christ comes, the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power will work this. He will work this by His presence, by the glory of His power. But I want you to understand something of what this death, this living death will be. The carnal mind is enmity against God, hates God. Ever since man fell in Adam, man comes in the world with a mind that hates God. And after Adam sinned, when they heard the Lord speak in the garden, what did they do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord in the trees. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They didn't want to be in the presence of the Lord, so they hid themselves. Sinners go through life desiring to be free from the presence of the Lord. Listen to Job 21.8 if you want to look at it. Job 21.8. Sinners go through this life, unregenerate sinners. They don't want the presence of, they don't want to be in the presence of the Lord. Job 21.8. Look at this. Their seed is established in their sight with them, their children and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp, rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore, they say unto God, Depart from us. Depart from us. For we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? You see that? You've experienced this, brethren. I, and for a preacher, you can just be in the same room with somebody. When they find out you're a preacher, you can feel the enmity. They don't want to be in the room with you. They don't want to have anything to do with you. And, and it's so whether they're your biological family, your children, it don't matter. And, and if you start pre speaking the gospel to somebody, you've experienced it. They'll change the subject, won't they? If they don't want the presence of the Lord, and you represent the presence of the Lord to them when you start speaking the truth. And when Christ returns, this is how depraved the human heart is. When Christ returns, he said they're going to try to run from the presence of the Lord. He said in Isaiah 2, 21, they'll go into the clefts of the rocks and the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to take, shake terribly the earth. But in judgment, when Christ comes, here's what Christ is going to work. He's going to give sinners what they have wanted all their life. Be careful what you want. Man wants to go around boasting of his free will. I'm free. I, what men are saying is, I'm free from God to do what I will. God doesn't tell me what to do. That's what men are saying. Be careful what you will. Be careful what you want, because one day, if you meet him without Christ, he will give you what you want. And that's what he's going to do. Right now, they say, depart from us. You know what he's going to say in that day? Christ said, then I'll say to them, depart from me. Depart from my presence. You cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Now our text says it's, they'll go away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Christ is the glory of God, and he uphold, upholds all things right now by the word of his power. He's, that the, he's the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. That's what Hebrews 1.3 says. 2 Peter 3.7 says, The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. He's holding everything in store just like he did before the flood. And it's reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now listen, that presence that carnal man doesn't want to be in, they don't want the Lord's presence, they don't want his power, his glory, they don't have anything to do with it. But that presence and power is benefiting even unregenerate carnal men 
right now. Right now. Because he's restraining the hell that's in natural man's heart all over this world right now. He's restraining the hell in man's heart. We can get to debating and, you know, where is hell? What is hell? Hell is the carnal man's heart. And hell will be God taking the casting men out from the presence of his glory and from the power of his restraining hand so that they can really have vent, uh, the vent of their will. And everybody can. Oh, there will be a great gulf fixed and they won't be able to come to where God's saints are. But in hell, men won't have that restraining hand upon them now. They, they, they're going to have a will that's free and find out just how bad that will be. Do you imagine being someplace where everybody in that place could do whatever came to their mind? Right now, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. There's a, you, you look into this world right now, unregenerate men, they blame God. Well, if a good God, why does he let so many bad things happen? We see wars and murders and all these terrible evils committed. Man commits that. That's out of man's heart. And if it comes to pass, it's only because the Lord permitted it because he's working it together with everything else to work his will, to, to glorify his son and save his people. But hell will be a place where sinners are cast out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power where they can do what they will. One reason it's called the lake of fire is because without the restraining stability of Christ's presence, it's a place as unstable as water, a burning water because of the hell of men's wicked hearts. It's called outer darkness because Christ the light's not there. Cast out of his presence cast out of his power, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And worst of all, there will be an everlasting sight of what men could have had. An everlasting sight of what they could have had and what they can never have. He said in Luke 13, 28, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see He's speaking to the rich, talking about rich, the rich man in hell. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. You think about a, it'll be like a, I've used this in illustration many times, but it'll be like a prosecuting attorney who put a whole bunch of wicked men in prison and then him getting sent to that prison himself. Right there with him. You imagine the false preacher. You imagine the father, the mother, who knew the gospel but did not teach it and would not preach it to those under their influence. Imagine them being in a place where now all the restraints are off and those that they wouldn't teach see what they could have had and they can vent their venom upon that one who would not teach them. Now, let's talk about God's justice upon the Lord Jesus. And the reason it will be just for God to have mercy upon his people and freely give his elect eternal life is because everything I just talked about in that second death is what Christ bore on the cross. You don't think I'm sitting here telling you all about the wickedness of hell and the evil of hell just to try to scare the hell out of you, do you? I'm telling you, because that's what Christ bore on the cross. You want to see something about the justice of God, look to the cross and you'll see the hell Christ bore, the second death, that living death he bore for his people. He bore the sin of his people. And because he did, God made him a curse. Oh, we don't understand what that means. He made him a curse for us. That's what he did for all his elect. Unregenerate men gnashed on him all around the cross. They gnashed on him with their teeth. The devil and all the wicked angels that we can't see, they gnashed on him. They tried to unleash hell upon him. 
But worse than all of that, worse than all of that, brethren, is the flaming fire of God's vengeance that fell on the Lord Jesus Christ in the place of you and me who believe. Psalm 22, let's look there real quick. Psalm 22, 1. In three hours, three hours of darkness, he bore the fire of God's wrath. He was cut off from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, brethren. Psalm 22, 1, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's, what it, that's the second death. And here's why he did it. Verse 3, But thou art holy. And bearing the sin of his people, Christ said about himself in verse 6, But I am a worm and no man. Look at verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Look at Isaiah 53, 8. Isaiah 53, 8. That's, that's, was Christ alive when he was bearing all that? Yes, he was. You see, this second death... It's, it's a death, all right, but it's a living death. And Christ suffered that living death on Calvary's cross. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 8. It says there in the second part, He was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Mm. But here's the result in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That doesn't mean God just took some sort of wicked delight to do that to his son. It means he satisfied the justice of God. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's what it means. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. I said there's a, a because attached to man's condemnation. There's a because attached to God's salvation of his people too. And here it is. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What he accomplished by that? He satisfied divine justice. He purged the sins of all his people, and he accomplished eternal redemption for us. When he had by himself purged our sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Here's what he accomplished by it. Hebrews 9, 12, the second part there says, By his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now we're talking about judgment, brethren. We're talking about you coming into judgment. You're going to die, and then you're going to face judgment. But look at what it says in verse 26. Hebrews 9, 26. Hebrews 9, 26. He says there, Now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, one judgment. That's the point there. One, one death and one judgment. So Christ was once offered. <laughs> he was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Your judgment's accomplished, child of God. Now that's why I'm urging those that don't believe to believe on him. The only way you can is if the Spirit of God comes and gives you a heart, but he does that for everybody he's satisfied justice for. And you're going to do it through this word. You're going to hear a preacher one of these days. If you're his and he did that for you, one of these days you're going to hear me preach. And you're not going to hear me. You're going to hear Christ. And not only are you going to hear Christ, you're going to obey Christ. You're going to fall down and believe on him if he is. I guarantee it. So lastly, back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, what will Christ, what will his return mean for you that are looking for him by faith? It says, 
to all them that look for him. What's, what's it going to mean for you that are looking to him? What's he going to repay you? <laughs> he already, he bore the recompense that we deserved. God paid him the wages we had earned. Now what's he going to give you? Instead of righteous tribulation, Christ is going to give us righteous rest. Look here in verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. While he's given that righteous tribulation to them to trouble you, he's going to give us rest. Rest with us when he shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Look at verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day child of God right now when men of this world trouble you think about that last day and think about how Christ is going to give his people rest and just rest in him right now he said come into the stronghold to the indignation be overpassed you just rest in him trust him and he'll give you rest right now and he'll bruise Satan under your feet shortly but be assured of this in that day when he returns he's going to give you rest and it's righteous and just for him to give you rest he, he bought it. He paid the price. Peter said, Rejoice in as much as you partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. What did Paul say in Colossians 3, 4? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with Him in glory. That's it, brethren. The unbelieving is going to be cast out of His presence and from his presence and from the glory of his power, and you're going to be ushered right into the full presence and the full glory of our Lord. And you're going to glory only in him. He's coming to be glorified by you. That's what it means. He's coming to be glorified by his saints. He's coming to be admired by all his saints. We admire him now. We glory in him now. But in that day, we're going to do it in perfection. What do we see in Isaiah 45? It said, In the Lord shall all Israel be justified, and in the Lord shall all glory. Well, he's coming to, he said, I'm not going to share my glory with another. He's coming to receive from us the glory that belongs to him. We're going to say with that host of heaven what John saw him say in Revelation 7, 12. They said, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Now listen. He said, if you're children, then you're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that you suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. John said, it don't appear what we shall be, but we know this. When we see him, we're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be like him. And here's why. Was this because of something we did? Is this because of some works we did? And all these, you know, that men are preaching? No. Here it is, the parentheses. Because our testimony among you was believed. That's it. God in his grace sent the gospel to you. He sent the spirit of God to you. He gave you a heart to believe him, to hear him and believe him and trust him. And it's all simply by his grace in Christ's righteousness because he gave you the faith to just trust him, believe him. What's our testimony? What is it? Christ has finished the works. <laughs> Christ is all. God's made him all to his people. He is wisdom. He is righteousness. He is sanctification. He is redemption. That's all you need. That's what he is to his people. Our testimony is Christ is salvation. And you believed him. When he sent that gospel to you, he gave you faith and you believed him. So just rest in him now. Whatever persecution comes, whatever trouble comes, it's to grow us to trust him more so that we'll be counted worthy of the kingdom. And when he come, and he'll give you rest right now, but when he comes, he's going to give you eternal rest. And he's going to bring you to see him so fully and be like him so fully and be without sin so perfectly that you're going to glory in him and admire him in perfection. That's what he's bringing his people to do. That's why he saved his people. So live every day. <laughs> live every day with every moment. We, don't you just 
I wish we could do this every moment. Looking for Christ to return. Anything you see that makes you think it just just and that's how you know when something happens and the Lord's people some odd thing occurs and or something in the scripture happens, you know, that we we looking for in the scripture, we'll the Lord's people don't they don't run and hide. They don't want to run from his presence. The Lord's people are saying, Come, Lord. This is what he, this is how the book ends. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And this is what the bride says. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So I hope that's a blessing to you, brethren. I hope that you that don't believe will believe. And you that believe, I pray you'll just rest in him. Leave vengeance to him.